Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is a podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you as always by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am excited to have yet another author interview to present to you today. Today, I am speaking with author Lisa Jacob about her second book, Not Just Me, and it is a book about some of her struggles with anxiety and depression, and it really resonated with me. I read her her first book, You Look Like That Girl, um, several months ago, and I read it actually a lot in the mornings and afternoons while I was commuting and I was riding the train. And she has this really wonderful, witty way of writing. I kept snorting or laughing straight out loud, and I was getting a lot of weird looks on the train <laughs> thanks to that book. But she does talk a little bit about her uh, anxiety issues in that book. And I really appreciated the way she was so forthright about them, but also she was able to really hmm, normalize isn't quite the word that I want to use, but she just embraces it as a part of her life, as something that she is working through. She's able to look at these issues through a lens of humor and a lens of understanding and learning to love herself because of or in spite of these parts of her mental makeup. So I really appreciated that. So when I saw that she had written the second book, Not Just Me, I was very excited to read it because I was interested to learn more about her struggle and um, the things that she has learned to overcome those, those issues. I I'm not going to make this about me, but I have struggled with similar issues throughout my life. So the whole time I was reading this book, I kept thinking, yes, oh my gosh, yes, that's me. And I know that uh, mental health issues can be very, very isolating for a lot of people. So I'm so grateful that there are books like this that give us those moments to be able to say, yes. I totally understand that. I totally resonate with what you just wrote. I completely get that. Wow. Okay. So it isn't just me. Hey, look, there's the title of the book. Let me read you uh, the excerpt from the back of the book and uh, give you the subtitle too, because the subtitle is great. So it's not just me. And the subtitle is anxiety, depression, depression, excuse me, and learning to embrace your weird. (laughs) So that gives you, you know, it gives you even the title gives you an idea of what this book is going to look like. It's going to cover a serious topic, but there's going to be a dose of humor in there as well. So here is that description of Lisa's book. Lisa Jacob has always been a little weird, sensitive, emotional, introverted. What else would you expect from a former child actor turned writer? But the issue wasn't just an artistic temperament. Lisa was constantly trying to hide her debilitating anxiety and depression. She assumed that retiring from her 18-year acting career and leaving Hollywood was going to be the cure for all of her issues. Guess how that worked out? Lisa was still having three panic attacks a day and found it hard to leave her house. But when anxiety-induced vomiting claimed the life of her iPod, she knew it was time to get help. It was time to talk about the things that are hard to talk about. She started to embrace her weird. In searching for a deeper understanding of mental wellness, Lisa explored her own history and reached out to others to learn how anxiety and depression impacted their lives. She interviewed veterans with PTSD and 10-year-olds with sensory integration issues, people with eating disorders and cutting habits, those whose lives were saved by medication and those who found yoga to be the answer. She went to Colorado to learn about the effects of cannabis on anxiety and attended a meditation retreat in North Carolina to sit quietly for hours and hours and hours in noble silence without a phone. 
Not Just Me is a hopeful, entertaining, enlightening look at the root causes of anxiety, the latest research on mood disorders, and ideas for how we can all live authentically with more peace, power, and purpose. Part memoir, part journalistic exploration, this book reminds us all that we are not alone. And that is a really good description of the book because it gives you an idea of how it does mix in not only Lisa's own experience, but also a lot of research that she did in preparation for writing this book, and that the writing style is going to be a little bit quirky, a little bit sarcastic sometimes, and just, it's a lot of fun to read, which sounds a little strange when you're talking about a book about anxiety and depression. And of course, there are parts that are hard. There were parts that felt overwhelming to me as I as I kind of thought about my own things, my own issues, my own life. But overall, it really is this hopeful, enjoyable book that does make you realize that you are not alone. There are other people out there. There are people who um, embrace their weird and encourage you to embrace yours as well. And this book also gives you some really concrete ways to go about doing that. Things that you can try, things that you can start looking into. So that's enough for me. I'm going to turn now to my interview with Lisa Jacob about her book, Not Just Me. Hi, Lisa. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to talk to you. So we are here to talk about your newest book, Not Just Me. But before we do that, I would love for my listeners just to get to know you a little bit. So if you could share whatever you're comfortable sharing, that would be great. Yeah. It's always so hard to know where to start. Right. Let's see. I'm, Cana I'm Canadian. Let's start there. I was uh, born outside of Toronto. And I had a little bit of an unusual childhood due to a completely random encounter. I was uh, four years old and I was with my, my parents in a farmer's market um, in, in Toronto. And this guy came up to us and he worked for a company. They were casting a commercial and he wanted me to be in it. So um, because of that totally random encounter, I ended up being a child actor and uh, and acting was my life for about 18 years, starting when I was four. And so I worked in, in Canada and Toronto for many years and then started going out to Los Angeles and eventually moved to LA and worked pretty consistently. Um, I, I was in films that did well in the box office, um, like Mrs. Doubtfire and Independence Day. And I was in a whole lot of like super cheesy TV <laughs> movies and, and things like that and things that were, uh, you know, mostly ending up on the cutting room floor. So I had a, a varied career. And so when I was uh, in my early 20s, I had realized that I, I was getting increasingly unhappy in my my life. I wasn't passionate about acting anymore. Um, I, I felt like I was living somebody else's life. I, I felt like everyone around me was telling me I had this dream life, but I, I looked at the film industry. I looked at the competition. I looked at the criticism. I looked at the focus on physical appearance, and, and I just wasn't sure it was really the contribution to the world that I wanted to be making. So I took this giant leap, <laughs> and uh, everybody told me I was crazy, <laughs> and I quit acting. I, I left Los Angeles. I moved to Virginia, and um, it was quite terrifying. I had never really had the chance to go to school. I didn't have a high school diploma. I, I worked all the time. That was, was my life. So trying to figure out what to do next without that sort of basis that most other people have of going to school and thinking all through your childhood, you know, what do I want to be when I grow up? I never had that. I, I already had a, a resume by the time I started kindergarten. So um, it was really a, a, a time for me to, to figure out who I was and who I wanted to be. And uh, that all led me to, to what I'm doing now, which is I'm a writer. And that is kind of the most amazing thing I can imagine. I, I, it's funny, I still like 
get tingles along my neck every time I get to say I'm a writer <laughs> because it's it's really um, it's really something that I I feel is representative of of what I want to be doing in the world and I'm I'm greatly honored that I get to do that with my days. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Your second book, this is your second book, is called um, Not Just Me. Can you give us a bit of an overview about that? So my entire life, I have struggled with anxiety and occasional depression. And it's just something that has has always been part of life for me. It, it comes and goes. There are times when it's pretty severe and times when it's not that bad, but it's something that I have had to continually manage since I was about 10 or 11. I remember having my first panic attack. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I wrote my first book, which was a, a memoir and I was touring around with that book and I would do a lot of talks at, at colleges and high schools and, and conferences and I would talk about authenticity and, and, and things like that. And I would always, in my talks, mention the fact that, that I have anxiety. And I would always mention it because I thought it was very clear that I was super nervous standing up in front of all these people. So I was like, I just need to cop to this and tell people I have anxiety. And like, let's just put it all out there. Mm -hmm. And I ended up time and time again at the end of these talks, having 15 people come up to me in tears saying, I can't believe you're talking about anxiety. Why don't people talk about this? I have anxiety and I haven't told anybody. I don't know what to do. I'm ashamed and I'm scared. And what do I do? And why aren't we talking about this more? Mm -hmm. So it became abundantly clear to me that this is a topic that we need to be talking more about. And so that's why I decided to, to write this book and really just crack this issue open for myself and give a place and a space for other people to be able to tell their stories and share what anxiety looks like in their life. And this is um, both a book, it's a book that combines a lot of factual content about not only anxiety and depression, but a little bit about mental health in general. But it's also for you an incredibly personal topic. So did that exacerbate your anxiety the, the, to decide to write something like this that is incredibly personal? It's really funny because as I was thinking, okay, I want to write this book, there were so many times where I almost chickened out for exactly that reason, where I worried that if I spent two years diving into this topic, was it going to make it so much worse for me? Was it going to kind of set me back um, and, and, and negate some of the progress that I felt like I had made in therapy and things like that if I just immersed myself in the topic? And what I found was the complete opposite. It really helped me just to be super transparent, super honest, and really just just talk about what my experience was. And I felt like that really helped me to both own it and let it go. So that was a really interesting kind of paradox. But um, yeah, that was definitely something I was worried about. I'm going to jump in here because we do have to take our first break of the podcast, but I'm also going to share uh, one little thing before we do go to break. And that is, as I was preparing for this interview and doing this interview, I kept thinking, okay, I don't want to say anything that might uh, trigger Lisa's anxiety because I know that sometimes that can happen and you never know what's going to do that. But then, of course, that sort of triggered my anxiety. And I I kept thinking, okay, this is going to be awkward altogether. If I, I'm worried about triggering her anxiety, but it's triggering my anxiety, which then might trigger... Never mind. Yeah, you can see how my brain sometimes works. That's just my silly little interjection, but we are going to take our first break of the podcast. So stay tuned. You are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Always on the go, but the day just won't be one without your Hollywood fix. Let Golden State Media Concepts Entertainment Podcast take care of that. Jordan and Keith is Entertainment Tonight meets Access Hollywood. I'm Jordan. The guy laughing, that's Keith. <laughs> yeah, I'm Keith. An all-inclusive look of pop culture.
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the continuation of my interview with author Lisa Jacob about her book, Not Just Me. Yeah, and in the beginning of the book, you talk about going to speak with your therapist who you hadn't seen in a couple of years and asking for your medical records and just the the whole process of that and wondering what you were going to to read there in black and white about your diagnoses. Yeah, that was a very scary moment. That was a very scary moment because you know how you feel feel in the moment, but to take a look at at your therapist's notes and, and, and your clinical diagnosis, it's it's a really strange experience to sort of step into an outsider's perspective of of what you were going through. And for me anyway, it ended up really validating everything that I felt. Right. Whereas I, I I I was a little bit worried, you know, maybe I'm just uh, you know, a big crybaby, <laughs> you know, but, but it's like I could look at those records and say, no, I have a medical diagnosis. This is a real thing. You know, this is, this is not, oh, I should just buck up and get over it, which is, I think, what so many of us with anxiety are really concerned about that, that we're going to be perceived as, as weak. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to be told to just get over it. And for me, getting those records, seeing seeing diagnostic codes was was actually super reassuring. Well, and I would worry about the um, qualifications of your therapist. If she had just written in your notes, Lisa is a big crybaby and she needs to get over <laughs> true. it. I mean, you might want to reevaluate. That's true. And then, of course, I would worry, like, how much money did I give this woman who knows right. nothing about what she's doing? <laughs> Yes, but that is a, a common um, a common thing that people in a, with anxiety or with any number of mental illnesses in this country face every day. It's just get over it. Just think happy thoughts. Just you know, uh, just I think just get over it really covers it. But how do you address that kind of attitude when it comes to your own life and and talking to others about their struggles? I think that the whole positive psychology thing can be really tricky because I think it can turn into um, blaming and guilt and all of these other things that if you can't just, you know, happy think your way out of something, then you're just doing it wrong and you're a failure at that too. So I think that that has been um, a really difficult thing. And I think that, you know, a lot of the positive psychology stuff, I think it comes out of a good place. And I do believe that, you know, you're going to have, have better results and a happier life if you're not constantly focusing on the negative and if, you, if you're, you know, looking for more positive things. But um, it's not the end-all, be-all answer. And I, I think that this idea of, you know, buck up and get over it. Luckily, I think it's very old thinking. I mean, it's just antiquated. And I think that the more people are talking about their experiences with various mental wellness issues, that people are realizing that you might as well say like, hey, why don't you buck up and get over your pancreatic cancer? You know, it just doesn't it doesn't work like that. And so I think that the more we continue to talk about this topic, the more that um, people are open and unashamed because there is still this stigma. And so I, I love it when people are open about talking about it. Um, You know, more people that, that have, uh, you know, public presence are talking about it. And I think it's just, it's super important to make people realize that this is not just, you know, you're making a choice to be in a bad mood. Um, so I'm very encouraged that, that the tides are changing on that and that people are realizing that's just, it's just not reasonable. Right. Yeah. How much research did you do for this book and what did that look like? I did a ton of research and I loved that. Um, I, I am such a book nerd and to be able to just sort of dive into this topic that I have been living with my entire life and I've, you know, done some research into, but to really get into, um, the science 
of anxiety and depression, really get into uh, reading medical journals about the studies and all that sort of stuff was so much fun for me. And I, I really enjoyed that. So it took me about two years to write the book. And I did a whole lot of research and a lot of interviews with people as well. So that was really important to me that it not just be another memoir of here's what my anxiety looks like, but I wanted to intertwine that with the research, with other people's experiences, and with really practical tools that people can can use and and try out. And there is no simple one size fits all answer, but I think for a lot of us that deal with this, we feel like there are no answers. We feel like we're just helpless and it's just gonna be like this forever. And I find it really helpful when when somebody can kind of throw out six different things. Like, hey, maybe you can try this or try this or try this. And maybe just one thing will work, but that's really all you need. Um, so that was really important to me to have very actionable, like sit down and try this today and see if it works for you things that, that I could offer to the readers. Mm -hmm. And you said, you know, there's the, people try different things for you. You chose, um, not to do medication and you've tried uh, other ways of handling your anxiety and your bouts with depression. Can you talk a little bit about, um, those those alternate methods that you've used? Yeah, so I am not at all anti-medication. I think medication can be incredibly useful and important and in some cases absolutely necessary. So um, I am not at all against medication, but for me, I wanted to try other things first. Um, and that comes from the fact that I am extremely sensitive. If I have caffeine, I am wired. If I have half, half a glass of wine, I am drunk. Like, I just react really, really strongly to things. So I was concerned about side effects. Mm -hmm. And I was prescribed medication, and I had a little bottle on my kitchen counter that I kept for years. Um, and I always felt so reassured that I had that as a backup. But I wanted to investigate other things as well. So two of the things that were hugely important for me in helping get the anxiety under control, um, meditation and yoga. And those are things that to this day are part of my daily practice. And I consider them to be medication. Like, that's how important it is that I get those things in, um, into my day. Because if I don't, I, I feel a noticeable change in, in my mood. Um, and there are tons of studies and all this research to, to back that up. But, um, what I found most persuasive is just, I tried it. It worked for me. When I don't do it, I feel worse. And so that's, that's what convinced me. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you teach yoga now as well. Is that correct? I do. I do. I, uh, actually it is my one year anniversary today of, of graduating from yoga teacher school. <laughs> Happy so anniversary. I've been teaching for, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been practicing yoga for almost 10 years, nine or 10 years. And so last year I decided that I really wanted to be able to, to share this because it has been so, so important for me. And so I do, I teach now and I, I specifically like to teach yoga for anxiety. All yoga will work for anxiety, but I really like to focus on, um, you know, we're not, we're not doing this to get killer abs, right? We're, we're doing this to really connect with that, that, still place that everybody has in them. But, but if, you know, you're like me and have anxiety, it gets drowned out by this, you know, wild monkey that we feel like we have in our brains. that's just constantly bouncing around and, and sometimes ruining our lives. So I like to focus when I'm, when I'm teaching and when I'm practicing on being able to, to access that, 
that breath and that sense of stillness where we can remember that um, the thoughts are just thoughts and we can make different choices. Mm -hmm. In the book, when you first, when you talked about first trying yoga, you tried um, hot yoga. Do you still practice that or do you, what kind of yoga do you practice generally? I do. I practice hot yoga, uh, which the first time I tried it, I absolutely hated it and thought those people were insane. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I kept going back and, and gave it a few more tries and I f- absolutely fell in love with it. So, yes, the yoga I practice is hot yoga. The yoga that I teach is um, is not hot. It's, it's basically slow flow vinyasa. And I did my, my uh, yoga teacher training up at Kripalu in Massachusetts, which is an incredible yoga center. And they have a really wonderful kind of um, very integrated mind-body system for, for yoga that is really useful for helping with, uh, with trauma and sort of processing any kind of anxiety or depression. So that's been something that I've been moving more into and I, I really enjoy also is, is teaching yoga for, for um, overcoming trauma and for veterans with PTSD. That's one of the groups that I teach and, and it's just, it's been a fantastic experience. Yeah. And you also do um, writing workshops as well that uh, often have a yoga component, correct? Yeah, that's been a fun uh, new experience for me that I've been been starting recently is doing a weekend workshop where we do yoga and we meditate and we write. And there are really incredible connections between writing and yoga. And it really is just a great way. If you have those two things working together, you can you can really kind of process some stuff and, and, and get through some some of that, um, those dark clouds that a lot of us carry around. And, and it's been a really wonderful experience to be able to share that with people. We have, you know, fairly small groups that we do. We spend three or four days together working on all this stuff. And it's, um, it's, been, it's been really exciting and really beautiful to watch people um, deal with some of the things that they've been, they've been carrying for years. I am going to jump in here for the second break of our podcast, but you can see from this past section how Lisa really does approach this topic in terms of what are some concrete and tangible ways that we can deal with anxiety, depression, or whatever we might be facing, and what are ways that we can really increase and embrace our mental wellness so that we can live healthier and more productive lives and just be the best version of ourselves that we possibly can. And with that, we are going to take our second break of the podcast. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion to my interview with author Lisa Jacob about her book, Not Just Me. Is there um, one overarching theme that you would like for people to take away from this book? I think the thing that I found so incredible as I interviewed dozens of people for this book 
was that everybody's circumstances were different. I interviewed, you know, 10 year olds who struggled with perfectionism and had sensory disorder issues and veterans who had PTSD and people who were cutters and people who attempted suicide and people who had eating disorders. And they all had such different lives and the anxiety and depression tended to present itself in all these different ways. But so many of the things that I heard were so similar. People always feel like it's just me. I'm just weird and nobody else can understand. They feel like they have to hide what's going on. They feel like, you know, otherwise their lives are kind of okay. So they feel really guilty that this is an issue for them. Like the same things kept coming up over and over again. And I think it was just such a reminder to me. And I, I hope that readers get this too, that if you are dealing with this stuff, you are not alone. So many people are are really struggling with this. And I think that that alone is really reassuring. And I think it's so, so important to be able to talk about this and to be honest about it. And it's not like, oh, you're just wanting attention and putting it all on you. But what I've realized is that when I talk about these issues, what I'm actually doing is freeing up somebody else to feel like they're allowed to talk about the things they're struggling with too. So it's not just this self-serving thing. It really does help diminish the stigma and it helps other people to feel like they're allowed to, to share the things that are hard as well. And I think that that is, um, is what is going to really help to move this issue forward and, and get rid of this shroud of shame that so many of us carry around about it. Mm -hmm. I think that comes through very well in the book. And um, I, for one, appreciate that you wrote it and that you shared your, not only your story, but the stories of the folks that you interviewed, because it really did give different perspectives and um, you know, not everyone was from the same set of circumstances and yet they all struggled in various ways and you know they never they, they didn't necessarily find the perfect answer but they found what worked for them and what could help so I think that was very helpful thank you I'm I'm, I'm glad yeah so um, this is your second book uh, tell us a little bit about your first book you look like that girl <laughs> which I love the title yes thank you <laughs> Uh, you Look Like That Girl is something that I still, to this day, hear a lot. It's really funny. Um, I, you know, I was working out at my gym the other day, and uh, one of the girls came up to me and was like, you look like that girl from Mrs. Doubtfire. And it shocks me. The movie was 25 years ago. Uh -huh. um, but that book is a memoir, and so it's about what it was like growing up in in that Hollywood world and what happened when I decided that that wasn't the path that I wanted to take anymore and uh, and I decided to leave Los Angeles and retire and, and kind of what that looked like and, and how I dealt with the fact that um, everybody thought I was insane for for leaving a, a fairly successful career in in film so I I originally wrote that book just for me. I, I didn't have plans on publishing it. It was just something I have always loved writing. It's how I process the world. It's how I figure out what I think about things. It's, you know, nothing feels re real to me unless I write it down. So that is something that's always been important to me since I was a little kid. And so I wrote it after I left Los Angeles, literally just to be like, okay, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> I just blew up my life. Hold on. Let me look at this. And it really is a story that um, I think even though the circumstances are a little bit unusual, I think a lot of people can relate to it. And that I, I woke up one morning and went, oh my God, what am I doing with my life? Wait a minute, is this actually where I want to be and who I want to be? And, 
And then how do you deal with the consequences of that? And I think most people at some point hit that hit that moment in their lives where they really have to think, is this is this how I want to be spending my time? Um, so I, I wrote it just for me and my husband read it when I was finished and um, he has never been known to humor me about anything, which is one of the things I love about him. Um, and he read it and, and said, you know what, babe, I think you should try to publish this because I think it could be helpful to people who maybe feel like they have a different version of success than other people. Maybe think like, you know, this, this path might look pretty and shiny, but it's actually not the path that I want. Um, and so I, at that point, decided like, oh, maybe I'll see what, what I can do with it. And, um, and then that kind of all snowballed, and I'm I'm so so grateful that it that it did. Yeah, um, maybe this is a little preemptive, but are you working on another book, or and if so, what does that look like? I am not working on another book. I will be working on another book. There, book three is is in there percolating somewhere. But at this point, I'm really focusing on on teaching and and doing these. Um, the writing and yoga workshops, that's, that's really where my heart is right now. And so I'm, uh, I'm focusing more on, on that. And we also just rescued a dog. So she takes up a whole lot of my time too. Yes. What kind of a dog? Uh, total mutt. Nice. Absolute mutt. Uh, yeah, we, we, even the vet is confused about what she oh, is. So we don't totally know, but she's, uh, she's about 50 pounds of pure love. Oh, so she's. She's pretty awesome. But she also has anxiety, of course. Oh, well. I would adopt a dog with anxiety. So oh, sure. We've, uh, you know, we're working on all of her issues, which, of course, makes me work on all of my issues. So it's been, it's been a really interesting time. Yes. I think maybe, maybe the next book needs to be about dog anxiety. I'm not sure. Maybe. Does she do yoga with you? Uh, she or does, does she try? Actually. I mean... Uh, she, yes, uh, she definitely tries, and she's she's gotten good. We have um, one of the first uh, commands that I taught her was no pause on the mat mm. because she would come and just basically like, you know, try to hug me as I was on the yoga mat. So now she comes with me, and she has her own little space in the yoga room, and she lies down and is very peaceful. So oh, nice. It's, we're making good progress with yeah. that. I have two chihuahuas that are um, not terribly helpful at all when I try to do yoga because they want to lick me <laughs> and jump on me. And, you know, I mean, they're tiny, but it doesn't help. Yes, absolutely. So what advice would you give for either aspiring authors or people who just want to write? I think that's it right there. Just write, um, which sounds so uh, easy and it's incredibly difficult, but I think that so many people get caught up in the um, the inner critic and the worry and the, well, you know, what is this at piece actually going to be and I'm a terrible seller and I don't know if this is good enough and this is an original, somebody's already written something like this. And I think this, the the people who are successful as writers and successful means they actually write successful doesn't have to do with, you know, bestseller list or, or, you know, Pulitzer's. It's all about like, are they actually writing? The people that are able to deal with all of that, um, that, that war going on in their heads, that just onslaught of, of the criticism and the doubt and the fear and all that, um, if you can get rid of that, and you'll uh, maybe not get rid of, if you can ignore it, it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. But if you can turn your attention away from that and towards the blank page and just write anyway, that's the whole key. Okay. That's it. Um, and it doesn't have to be good. The first draft of anything is terrible always. Um, you know, that's what editing's for. Mm -hmm. But really just getting into the flow of, of, of writing, of getting stuff down on paper and editing later. And I think that that is, um, that's the key to all of it. Okay. Thank you. 
When you take time to read, what are your favorite authors or genres? Oh, I love reading. So I love reading. I, I read all the time. It's incredibly important to me. So I always make time for that. I, I kind of read a little bit of everything. Um, right now I'm reading a really great book called The End of Alzheimer's. Hmm. Um, so like, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. So like I read nonfiction. I read fiction. I just read my first zombie book which I, World War Z, um, okay. which I'm not necessarily like a zombie person, but I realized I'd never read a zombie book, so I should do that. So I have kind of eclectic taste. Um, some of my favorite authors, um, Barbara Kingsolver, I love, um, you know, in terms of, of, of novels. Zadie Smith is wonderful. Writing it, people who write about writing, Anne Lamont is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, John Irving, I love because it's just strange. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of um, Hiroki Murakami, I love. Uh, 1284 is one of my favorite books. So, yeah, I'm a little bit all over the map, but I, um, I always make time for that. That's something that has been part of my life since I was a little kid. I used to walk into walls because I was reading while I was walking. Um, so, yeah, I've total nerd. Yeah. <laughs> I have been there. I totally understand. Yep, yep. Um, where can people find you on either social media or the Internet? Do you have a website? Yes, I do. So it's Lisa Jacob. Uh, Jacob is J-A-K-U-B. Dot net, And then I do all the social media stuff so you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, thank you so much for that information and for everything that you've shared with us today. Is there anything else that you would like to share that we haven't covered? No, I think this has been great. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to chat. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your weekend. I know that you are busy, so I really appreciate that you scheduled me in today. And um, thank you for the book. Thank you. Honestly, no, this has been um, just lovely. So thank you. Once again, I do want to thank my guest, author Lisa Jacob, for taking time to talk to me about not only her book, Not Just Me, but her first book, You Look Like That Girl. It was a lot of fun to talk to her about those books. I really enjoyed both of them. I highly recommend either of them. Um, I highly recommend Not Just Me, though, if you have ever struggled with any kind of anxiety, depression, any kind of mental health concerns, it's just a really approachable book to if, if you've never read a book about mental wellness, mental health, this is a great book to get your feet wet. And, you know, it's full of research and facts. Um, it's full of tangible ways to try to manage your own um, mental wellness. But also, you know, Lisa claim, Lisa states outright that she is not a doctor, that these are things that have worked for her. These are things that have worked for the people that she interviewed. But you should always, always seek help and find ways that you can improve your life, improve your mental wellness. So I just want to thank her again, not only for joining me, but for writing this book and getting it out there in the world, because I think it really is important and we don't talk about it enough. So this is a great and approachable book to, like I said, get your feet wet, jump into reading something about mental wellness and mental health issues. Thank you, as always, for joining me. I really appreciate you and uh, your tuning in to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I hope you will join me again on Thursday. I don't have a second interview scheduled this week. That That's very strange for me, but I'm excited to just sit and talk about some books with you. So I hope you'll join me on Thursday for that. In the meantime, you can find all of the GSMC podcasts, not just this one, but all of the podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can download all of our podcasts on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, any app that you use for your mobile device. And you can follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, Instagram. Um, there's also a blog associated with the podcast, and that is www.gsmcpodcast.com. Book review, 
www.blogspot.com. All of those links are in the show description, so you'll be able to find them. Thank you again for joining me. I hope you'll join me again on Thursday. But in the meantime, go out there and get yourself lost in a good book. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.